First of all, let me ask you, is there anyone in the room who is in for this because of the retail spin? One. The rest, two. The rest is mainly interested in Suze and salt, or whatever we're doing with it. Pixie. 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 Okay, cool. Yeah. No, I just wanted to make sure because this, the technology is not really about retail. It's just that that's where we are using it uh, first. Um, it's mostly because I have an internal team to work with on top of my SUSE manager team that has always been doing point of service and they are just um, doing most of that heavy lifting now. So don't think I need to be introduced again. You've seen me on stage just uh, about two hours ago. I've brought with me uh, Eric who is um, working in our storage SEF team and, and who is maintaining Deep Sea, which is our storage, um, well, our SEF, um, salt-based SEF automation framework. Um, this is not uh, on the agenda, but we figured that if there's time, like about 10 minutes to, towards the end of the talk, we'll also give um, Eric the chance to talk a bit about that particular project where we are also using Salt Pretty um, intensively. I've uploaded um, one of the um, hands-on sessions from our SUSECon in Prague a couple of weeks ago um, to the app, so if you want to know more, there is a, a full presentation that you can use there as well. Now, let's just dive into the point of service side uh, uh, really quickly. Um, there have been some challenges in point of service forever, basically, that are a bit specific. I mean, usually you have very large distributed infrastructure. Some of our customers have thousands of stores, and every store has maybe four, five, up to 20, 30 uh, devices, mostly cash registers, but this could also be like kiosk systems, uh, any kind of other infrastructure, and of course, increasingly now, digital signage, sensors, uh, uh, cameras, IoT stuff. Um, so in a way, we have always, for the last 15 or 20 years of, of SUSE's history in managing uh, Linux deployments, we've always helped those point of service customers with uh, an approach where we managed images. So um, one of the very first projects in Germany is a large um, department store chain similar to uh, maybe Macy's or so in, 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 uh, in the US, uh, who, or Sears, who um, actually were able to every morning boot all their cash registers into the latest image, and they were running them out of RAM. So that was um, one of the most highly automated setups you can think of. In a way, we are just renovating this existing stack, which is uh, showing its age. Now let's look into um, what we are doing here. So we have a traditional solution, uh, SUSE Linux Enterprise Point of Service, which under the hood basically is just three things. It's an LDAP server, it's um, tools for image building, for building Linux images that you can deploy. So the LDAP server knows where the image should go and also has some metadata about how to configure the branch office, like all the DNS, DHCP, all the infrastructure you need for a Pixie boot server, for netting to, uh, uh, to, to the rest of the network. Um, and the third part is just Perl scripts that basically bring it all together. That's uh, the, the point of service solution. It has done a great job for many retailers for many years, but it's showing its age, as I said. Uh, then we have SUSE Manager, which is basically, uh, uh, half of it is based on the Spacewalk project, so it has a long heritage of uh, managing patches and rolling out patches, mostly RPM-based package updates um, to uh, environments, and now, of course, with our SALT integration, about half of the code base now is is in, in one way or the other related to um, using salt under the hood to systems management, automation, and so on. So the solution, the traditional one, looks like that. You have the central server, you have a build server, which could be on the same machine, then the store infrastructure and the POS devices. Uh, as I said, basically LDAP, Perl, 
and uh, yeah, Linux services um, like a DHCP server, DNS server, and so on to facilitate the Pixie Boot stack. Uh, with um, quite a few large customers, they already have that mixed stack where we added SUSE Manager just next to the other stack. And this is what we are currently selling under the umbrella of uh, SUSE Manager for retail. Uh, what I'm talking about today is our next generation version uh, that is uh, planned for about June, July next year, where we are um, taking out all the old Pixie Boot code, all the old LDAP code, and um, switching to a salt-based approach. So can I, I think I can basically skip most of that here. Um, just think of those architectures as lots of sites that have lots of devices. They have a, a local infrastructure. Um, this doesn't have to be a retailer. The same technology would also work if you want to set up um, HPC clusters, for example. So it's the same basic concept. How can I bring up lots of mostly identical nodes um, and do that very often, like uh, if I want to uh, refresh those systems uh, uh, once a day or every, every week. Um, so there are two challenges that we have to address. Challenge number one is I have this branch server and I need to configure this branch server. And challenge number two, I have images that I need to pixie boot. Um, there's a lot more stuff going on, but basically we have that already because Salt does most of the heavy lifting. Um, so those are the two things I want to uh, focus on today. First of all, um, how do we solve the problem of setting up those branch servers? Um, about a year ago, we started a project um, called Formulas with Forms. The idea is pretty simple. So we take formulas, which are as I mentioned today in the, in the keynote talk, basically just a folder where you put in salt states and uh, you follow some rules. Yeah, yeah, there should be some documentation, there should be a pillars example file that gives you all the parameters that uh, can be injected into the formula. Um, we take that pillars example file and we annotate it. So if there's a field that says, I don't know, um, SSL true false, we annotate it and say, okay, this is a Boolean. So the browser, um, when it picks up that information, can render it as a, as a checkbox. And, and basically that annotated file that you can even auto-generate to some extent from a pillars example file, um, if the pillars example doesn't have any magic like Jinja loops or so, um, this can be rendered directly in a browser. Um, currently, this is built into SUSE Manager. It's, it's React.js components. So we are working on uh, ripping this out and, and, and making a, a separate project out of it where you basically can bring up, let's say, a, a Python-based, a Flask server, very lightweight uh, web um, REST API endpoint and, and serve those so you can play with it without having to have the full SUSE Manager stack. Um, what it then does, the browser basically, after you filled in the form, stores a JSON file with all the data uh, back to the server. And there's some magic going on in SUSE Manager where we map those to certain groups of machines. Yeah? So that's actually the, the current strength of it, how we can match those uh, two things. So I think states and modules, you... Yes, we are getting to that. So that's basically just uh, what states are about. Uh, I've taken that from our uh, generic salt um, explanations. In that case, for example, setting up a simple web server. Um, as I said, formulas, if you haven't worked with them yet, are just states combined into a package for achieving a certain task, like setting up a WordPress instance. Some are more granular, some are less granular. And uh, not all of them are really great, but they are always a good starting point for your own stuff. I think um, everyone should be familiar with the difference between the state-based approach and the execution-based approach in, in SALT. Uh, in this particular case, of course, we are talking about idempotent states that define how the system should look like. So in this case, for example, we are, if we want to use a job, we would use uh, this um, state module that describes, okay, user present versus an uh, 
uh, an execution-based approach where you have a command that adds a user through salt, but if you run it a second time, it will, of course, fail. The other important component is pillar data here. Basically, what we are doing is with the forms, we are just filling in pillar data. So we are generating pillars with a graphical UI or customizing pillars because, of course, there are defaults and it's only about overriding those defaults for specific cases for individual systems or for a group of systems, let's say all my web servers or all the machines in a certain organization. I always use that, that opportunity to point out that whenever you have data that should be secured in a way, don't use grains, don't go from the system and say, okay, this system has the role X, if you don't want someone to just change the role of the system by logging in, changing that, that, that grain, always use pillars which are secured by uh, individual encryption between client and server, and, and they are top-down. So your master is setting those pillars and your master is right, and a user on the box cannot as easily manipulate uh, the data as they would be able to do with, with grains. Now, the one thing I mentioned already, and uh, this was actually part of last year's keynote already, is that we combined the group system in, in, uh, in Spacewalk, in SUSE Manager, um, with salt states. Now, this was last year where we just said, okay, we can now apply a state to a group of systems, and then if you want to have another one of those, let's say another web server, just add it to the group, run high state on the group, and, and this machine will be an, uh, another web server. Uh, we now have the same thing for formulas, uh, which basically just means you have a, uh, the way of, you know, you, you can combine states in a formula and then you have the form um, to actually fill in stuff. And I'll show you in a minute how this looks. So in this case, this is a packaged formula. Um, the way we've done it in SUSE Manager, you can still just, um, you know, check those out of GitHub if you want. Uh, but the ones that we ship from SUSE, we have packaged them up as RPM packages. So in this case, I have a, an example called Web Server Formula that I just install. Once it's installed, um, it shows up in the formula catalog. So the guys from SUSE, those are still Manager 3.0 slides, but it's really the same thing, so I didn't want to go through redoing all the screenshots. This formula catalog just shows you all the formulas that are available, um, uh, that are installed on your server. Now you can uh, see some metadata. Uh, this is uh, pretty simple, but there's more, like we can have dependencies between those formulas and say, okay, this always has to come first in a workflow. And uh, then you have the so-called system groups, and that's really where the magic starts to happen, so you can assign a formula um, to a certain system group. We are now creating such a group, um, and then this group of web servers gets the web server um, formula assigned, and now you have an extra tab that, as you can see, has a, a couple of different field types. There even, even is a color picker down there, uh, a password field with a password generator. <coughs> we are currently adding more fields to that. Uh, this is a very flexible uh, framework, so um, we are now working on a field that is repeatable. Let's say if you have a partition table, like um, we had in the keynote today, and you want to say, I want one and up to five partitions. You could basically have a, a, a field type uh, pretty soon where you just have a plus button and you add yet another section and, and it asks you all the same things. And behind the scenes, this will be a, a basically a, a, a list or a dictionary of, of um, pillar data. <coughs> Sorry. That uh, then the formulas can iterate uh, through. Now, um, those are all the target systems we have. We can choose a few and add them to our web server group. And here we are back in that, um, on that formula, on the form. This is the result. Um, 
In this particular case, basically, we are customizing a web page. Behind the scenes, this is also installing Apache. Um, it'll open the ports in the firewall and so on. But um, for the sake of the demonstration, it's always nice to use this kind of colorful example because it shows like you can basically build a little content management system out of, out of those formulas. Um, last year at our SUSE con in Washington, which um, happened during election week, I, I did the same thing, but it was a results page where you could choose between Clinton and, uh, and uh, Trump and you know, add, add the, the current seats after every poll and so on. Um, now, in this case, so we had the chameleon, we, we changed the picture to a tux, and I think I'm also changing the, yeah, now that's just the picture change. And basically, it's always the same workflow. You change stuff in the form, you reapply the high state, the formula is run, and uh, you get your results. So, like, this is the background. You change the background, save the formula. And this is no magic. Under the hood, it's really just writing a JSON file with the pillar data to disk that is then picked up by SALT. Um, there's a mechanism in SALT that is really helpful for that. It's called external pillars. So if you're currently writing all your pillar data by hand in, a, in, a, in, a, in an SLS file, um, in many cases it may be helpful to write just the, one of those external pillars, which is basically a Python script that generates your pillars for you, and it can generate them from anything. It could, you know, query an SQL database or go into any other backend, your CMDB or so, and query it and inject um, pillars um, on the fly. <coughs> so let's look under the hood of this. Basically, there are two magic folders. There's a metadata folder and the states folder. Um, let's start with the metadata folder. For every formula, there has to be one of those. And in that particular case, of course, it's the web server. So there are two files in there. There's the form YAML and the metadata YAML. The form YAML is doing the ac um, actual um, form, obviously. So as you see, this is really looking pretty much like just plain YAML, but there are those um, dollar default, dollar if, uh, visible if, and so on, those annotations, they really um, add the magic. And it's basically done in a way where when you don't specify any, anything, you'll get a plain text field, and then you can add. You can add a default, you can make the text field uh, a select box and, and provide values and provide a default value to pick. Um, and then there's even this visible if. Those, those are conditionals, like if you have a, a, um, a Boolean, a checkbox uh, that you click and then this expands a section. So let's say you click on secure mode and then it asks you for more stuff, like you have to provide your, um, your security um, credentials. Uh, one thing we are planning going forward is even allowing callbacks in that. The idea is, um, let's say you have something like down there, the select box, and you want to be able to select from uh, the actual IP um, let's say the actual NICs on the box. So if you have three network cards in the box and you want to uh, be able to expose those, so um, there would be uh, some salt execution module code that would really call the, the, the actual machine and ask, okay, can you give me all your NICs? Um, that's something that is not going to work as easily when you uh, configure a whole cluster of machines, of course, because we'll have to figure out how do, do you figure out which one um, you use for your callbacks, but um, for customizing an individual system, that, that could be really powerful. Yeah, there's another thing that's called scope, and that's also very nice. So we have three scopes, basically. Um, you can either say, okay, basically the, the field is set in the YAML, and it's not editable. So you can look at it, but it's, it's basically just like you have configured a pillar uh, and it's a static uh, uh, parameter. Then you can say this is editable on the group level, but the individual system cannot change that value. So let's say all your web servers have that particular setting, and you can't change it. Uh, and finally, there is the, um, the system scope where the system can have its own particular value for that. 
Now that's again how it looks after the change. And then the metadata uh, YAML is, is optional. This is really just for adding uh, a, a description. And as I said, that's also the place where we can define dependencies between the tabs. So if you want something to show up first in the, in the, in the wizard workflow, you can put this in there. Sir. Yeah, we came up with that. It's not a standard. Um, we are trying to uh, make this kind of a standard, so we are working with SaltStack on making this part of the formula. Um, uh, yeah, we have, ex uh, we have documentation for that, and once we um, basically upstream all those changes, we want to make sure that this is also uh, well documented. Uh, there is no reason why we wouldn't still you know, accept ideas how to change things. Uh, just to give you one example, we are not too, let me just know I'm going the wrong way. We have those hidden groups, for example. This is basically namespaces. So if you say, I want to have my pillars, and they should always have a namespace of Apache dot something, uh, you can create those hidden groups which don't show up in the UI, um, so they don't get you an extra box. Uh, probably the better name for that would be saying namespace, yes, or, or level, or whatever. So we are still working on that. Uh, we'll, the, the version we have today will be backwards compatible, but at some point uh, we may extend on that. But it's a very simple format. I haven't found anything. Uh, I mean, there are lots of other form, formats for defining some kind of form, but most are pretty complicated. Um, they gave, give, me, give you more freedom to change stuff, but we wanted to keep it as simple as possible. Um, but this is, uh, as, as, as usual in SALT, I mean, you can, just like you can have any data input format and any output format in, in SALT by just adding your own renderer or your own, uh, your own input uh, parser, um, you could you just extend that. Um, and if you prefer XML-based or JSON-based, it shouldn't be hard to extend this. Yeah, then the other directory, the states directory, this is really just um, where you have a formula. And this is a simple one um, for the, the web server where we have all the images, for example, and so on. So that's basically all about the formulas with forms. Um, we are now using them, as I said, for the, the SUSE Manager for Retail Solution, bringing in all those um, formulas for setting up um, DNS, DHCP, NTP, and so on. Uh, to a large extent, the team was able to use upstream salt formulas and just um, add the form uh, definition to them. Now, the other thing um, quite a few of uh, you were interested in was the, the Pixie Boot stack. Um, the Pixie Boot under the hood is something really simple. Pixie Boot was invented in the, I don't know, late 80s or so by Intel as a standard pre boot execution environment. In a nutshell, it just means that you have something in the firmware of the, either the network card or the, um, the computer system that knows how to do a DHCP request without having an OS booted first. And then the DHCP server tells it, okay, you go to that server and that's where you will find an image to boot, which is usually in, in, in Linux's case, a Linux kernel and an, a, a RAM disk, an init RD. Um, that's all Pixie Boot is about in a nutshell. Now the trick is to configure those things on the fly. Uh, in our particular uh, case, there's some salt magic under the hood, so there's a salt runner that is probably going to be replaced by just reactors um, pretty soon. Um, there's image configuration um, that we are defining based on groups that the machine will later join. Um, so those, those will be hardware specific uh, groups. Let's say you have a certain type of um, point of service devices from a certain vendor. Um, you can define the vendor specific stuff uh, just basically with pillar data. Um, so that's, that's really where SALT out of the box gives you a lot of 
stuff already. Um, you can, of course, do a lot of that automatically. So the old framework that we were using um, it required you to uh, put all that information into the LDAP. So if you had a new type of hardware, you had to tell uh, the LDAP uh, directory about all those new parameters. Uh, with salt, some of that can be automated because you can just look at grains on the fly and then if the machine says, okay, I'm an HP box or I'm a, a Dell box, and there are differences in how you set it up, you can do all that in your formulas. You can basically query for certain grains and, and make this automated. Yeah. Um, the workflow for how this works is, is basically outlined here. Um, looks a bit complicated, but let me explain in a nutshell what happened be happens behind the scenes. So we boot a, a small Linux image out of the, the, the Pixie boot server, or uh, technically the TFTP server. Um, this image is run in RAM. It will start a salt minion right away. And this salt minion uh, will register or try to register against the salt master. Uh, in the current prototype, it will display you the, um, the salt key footprint on screen and also, of course, then in, on the salt master, you'll, you'll be able to use the salt key command or our graphical UI in SUSE Manager for accepting the key. Um, this is the most secure version because you can verify on screen whether you're talking about the same box, but of course it means that someone will have to log into SUSE Manager or use the salt key command on a, a salt master to accept it. Another thing that we have just submitted as a pull request uh, last week, and it's almost accepted, so Tom has already uh, given his blessings, allows you to add more metadata during the key acceptance phase. So if you look under the hood how this works in SALT, basically when a minion tries to authenticate, basically it sends a dictionary that contains its minion ID and the public key, um, the AES key that it's gonna use. Uh, and this was easy to extend, so we now allow to send any other grain you want to send. Let's say you have a grain for a un unique ID on the box or a serial number or a MAC address. Uh, you can do that. You can, during the, um, the key acceptance workflow, basically then have whitelists defined. So let's say you have a whitelist of MAC addresses that should automatically be accepted or a whitelist of um, serial numbers you got from your hardware vendor. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, that, that will make it uh, relatively easy to further automate this. And it's pretty secure because even the initial communication to the salt master is already encrypted by the client's um, private key. So you can, to some extent, make Pixie Boot secure. Pixie Boot is, is pretty insecure by default because anyone in your network who has access to your uh, DHCP server could just bring up a box and, and it will get um, a, an installation um, for free, more or less. With this, we, we can be more restrictive. It still has a few potential attack vectors which you would have to protect, for example, by using a TPM uh, kernel, a secure boot workflow, but it's, it's much better than, than before. Yeah, once the system has been accepted, SALT can take over. Um, we will take the partition table that was set up in uh, SUSE Manager or in your SALT um, pillars. We will download a certain image that was assigned to that type of boxes, and then you can run any SALT state. The cool thing about having SALT in the game so early is that um, this is not only going to be a provisioning workflow, but in a sense you can also um, halt the provisioning at some point and just issue other salt commands. So, for example, what we are going to do is, is just inventorize the whole system. So we can get a hardware inventory, software inventory. Um, you can use it to run commands like inspect the machine and say, okay, I want, before I do anything, I want to check if the hard disk is okay, like do a smart, smart check or anything. Or you can do a temperature check uh, just using any salt execution modules that are available. Uh, or running any shell command, of course, through, uh, through salt. 
Uh, that's very powerful because it's more like a state engine than just a pixie boot workflow. Um, that's one of the things that we love about that solution. And, and it has much less moving parts than if you have, let's say, a foreman or a cobbler uh, pixie boot server separately. It, on a SUSE side, it also means we don't need any Kickstart or Audios profiles anymore, as long as our initial image that we deploy is complete enough to have all the, you know, the graphics and, uh, and uh, network support and the kernel uh, to run on the specific box. That's basically um, the concept that we are um, following here. Again, we want to open, well, it's all open source software, but we want to make this a separate project that makes it very easy um, to set up the Pixie Boot just with Salt. Currently, we are calling it Salt Boot. And um, we will also provide um, images that you can, can use out of the box as part of our um, SUSE open build service. And then, of course, we, anyone who wants to do this with Ubuntu or so, they, they need to build their own um, boot images, but the, the rest of the framework should just work. Yeah. That's basically my part of the presentation. Um, if there are any questions about either the Pixie boot or the formula stuff, feel free to ask now. No, the, the boot image, so the question was, does, does it have to be a full um, uh, boot image, uh, a full OS image? The image that boots into RAM is really just a very small Linux OS that, that, that is capable of, uh, it has enough Python to, to basically bring up the salt minion and, and the salt code. And then you download the real image to disk and one thing I didn't mention, obviously, also the salt minions configuration is written to disk. So next time you boot, you'll stay, still be the same minion. So the key is not regenerated again. So this, uh, it, it's first, it all starts off in RAM, but after we have a partition, we have an, an image deployed on the partition, we can then also write the, the, the salt configuration to the disk. And next time it boots up, it, it will uh, know I, I'm, I'm the same minion. Uh, that second image has to be a reasonably complete Linux image, so it has to have uh, basically RPM installed in our case and, and Zipper or Yum on the Red Hat side so that Salt can install more stuff. Um, and then it's basically your choice whether you have a long uh, list of Salt states that, that install that system after the fact or you, you use that during build time and you have a build that already has everything pre-installed. Uh, pre yeah. uh, this will ultimately replace Autoyust in a way. Um, you can still mix and match the two. So SUSE Matcher also has Cobbler and Autoyust support th uh, through Cobbler. Um, but um, for the point of service case, um, we are not going to, uh, to need uh, Autoyust uh, or Kickstart anymore. Yeah, um, so the question was, um, are we planning to replace Cobbler? In a way, yes. So for, for the retail environment, we are already replacing it. So the branch server is fully managed through those formulas. Um, the DHCP, DNS, all the services are um, configured through Salt and not through uh, Cobbler anymore. Um, we will still, for at least one or two more versions of SUSE Manager, keep the Cobbler as is because there are workflows that have been established over time that people are used to. But we, we think that in the long run, we can rip out quite a few code uh, paths that are not really necessary because Salt can do most of that in a very nice way. Yeah, that's, that's currently the problem. It's open source, but it's not uh, in a public GitHub. 
that's what we what we are going to fix soon. Um, at the moment, it's really just in the developer tree of our SUSE Manager for Retail project. Um, once we have the beta, you'll be able to get the code through our uh, source RPMs, but of course that's not how a proper open source project works. Uh, this will be a separate open source project. Um, I'm not sure where exactly we will put that in the SALT ecosystem, but basically it will be a stripped down version of what we are doing that you can use as a starting point that basically just gives you a template, how do I set up this Pixie boot uh, server correctly, and, and we'll help you with at least the SUSE um, initial boot images uh, um, by building them daily in the uh, open build service. And of course documentation to, to wrap it all up. Uh, timeline, I can't give you exact numbers, but um, we are planning to ship the commercial product in June, July next year. Around the same time, I'm pretty sure we are going to have that. We are also trying to open up the whole SUSE manager deployment a bit more. Uh, we are currently working with the other ones, the Red Hat guys who are working on Spacewalk on how we do that because uh, they have lost a bit interest in the Spacewalk project but they still own it. So we'll either take it over in a friendly way or coexist in a friendly but forked way. So <laughs> uh, that's not, not, not exactly defined yet. But we hired a guy already who is going to manage this project. Yeah. So. I want to give Eric some time for the deep sea stuff. We are a bit running late, but he. I'm just exactly giving you a browser. Hello everyone, I'm Eric, as you heard, I'm part of the storage team. Okay, you're gonna have to type on your keyboard. Um, <laughs> what did you want? Uh, GitHub SUSE deep sea. <laughs> Is it uppercase, lowercase? Uh, I think you can just type ah, it. Ah, here we go. <laughs> That's it, I guess. Should I move it over to the? Yeah, if you just move it over. Here we go. Okay. There we go. No way. Oh, you're on the wiki. Just how do can I get over to So it's a wiki that one should be able to No, I just wanted the main page. Yeah. Oh, so you're not logged in. Okay. So hello everybody. Um I'm not gonna go into deep sea because there's not that much time. So effectively, since this is a SALT conference, um, how many of you are familiar with Ceph? All right. So short, Deep Sea lets you deploy and manage Ceph. Now, with respect to the SALT conference, I knew there wouldn't be much time here. So down here at the bottom of the first page, down in the readme, I've added a link for those of you who might be new to SALT. Um, and usually when you're new to SALT, you're looking for examples. So under the developers and admins, I've created a link and I've just covered uh, a few different topics that I ended up having to solve because of Ceph. Uh, one of the first things is if you are trying to configure Salt, most people when they're first introduced are told, go edit these SLS files. Well, if you, turn, if you have 10 servers with 24 drives in each one, you're not wanting to hand edit dev by disk ID 240 times. So just to let you know, you can use SALT to configure SALT, and that's actually what DeepSea does. Uh, another thing that if you are new to SALT, you may have been hearing about high state, although they did talk about orchestrations at this conference a bit more than they did, uh, I'd say at the previous conference. You don't have to use high state. In fact, DeepSea does not use high state at all. It completely relies on orchestrations. So depending on your particular environment and what you're trying to solve, <coughs> that may be useful to you. Uh, redirection. One of the things that you may learn about is the init.sls file. Something like, you know, directory file osd.sls is equivalent to directory osd slash init.sls. You can actually do some interesting things there with the init.sls by actually redirecting to other files. 
because the one thing that's different about, I would say, our project compared to most consumers of salt is you're using salt in your own environment. We're trying to give you a package so you can use salt in your environment to set up Ceph. I know it's not going to be 100% perfect, so how do I let you customize it yet still get upgrades for us? And that's where we allow redirection so you can just quite literally change one variable and change any component within Deep Sea. Um, if you're also new to SALT, you've probably been overwhelmed just by the sheer terminology, the number of components in SALT. You can get really far with just SALT states, runners, and execution modules. In fact, right now with Deep Sea, even though there's a little bit of an example in there with the reactor, it really is just states, runners, custom runners, and custom execution modules. I don't even have any state modules in it currently. Um, if you are interested in external pillars, one that's very simple and easy to use that's inside of SALT now, but if you have a slightly older version of SALT, it wasn't, it's called stack.py. Uh, effectively, it'll take your YAML files and merge them much like you would expect your dictionaries in Python to be. So it is worth your time to go look at that. Uh, Multi-process. Now everybody knows salt star test.ping. I can run whatever command I want. It runs on all my minions in parallel. But what if you need to run something on the minion in parallel? Well, you can use the Python multi-process. So if you're looking for an example of that, we have a multi.ping that actually lets you run all the processes across all the minions, but then ping each other across the interfaces in parallel. So that way you get a, you know, you can sit here and check your entire network within two seconds, as opposed to anything being serial. So there's an example of that. Uh, serial versus parallel. Uh, this one is, you know that salt will help you with running everything in parallel. But one of the problems you may run into or you may not have thought about with your particular project is, that's great when you're doing a fresh deployment, you have nothing, I wanna bring up, you know, 10, 20, 30 storage nodes simultaneously. But once you get gateways working and you have services running, you have to stop and realize, oh, when I make configuration changes, I do not need or do not want all my gateways to restart simultaneously. Oh, lovely noise. Um, one, that's one of the issues we've run into as well. And while you might be able to use the batch command to solve that problem, uh, we're actually solving it with the orchestrations as well. So there's examples for that. And I don't know how many of you may know about this, but, oh, can you hear me now? Okay, sorry. Yeah, the rattling of the AC kicking on, yeah, that was nice. Um, so I don't know how many of you may know about this, but SALT has an API. And people say, oh yeah, I've heard about SALT API. Well, it actually gives you a REST API. Um, you can write a runner to do whatever things you want inside of your environment and access it from that API. In fact, OpenAttic, that is how it talks to Deep Sea. So if you have uh, you know, your own GUI out there already and you just need a backend to talk to, it is already up and working. And finally, the salt reactor. Um, there's a lot of talk about the reactor, but sometimes it's hard to wrap your head around it and there's multiple pieces. There's a simple enough example in here. Probably the big takeaway from this is this one. Uh, one of the components in SALT is called the SALT queue. One of the solutions behind it is SQL Lite. If you are not doing their batch example, but you are trying to say, oh, I don't know, catch all the start starting events from you know, 18 minions starting simultaneously, and you were trying to decrement a queue, it will not work with that default queue. You'll end up with locks and contention. I have a file queue runner that's basically just using a symlink, it's cheap, but it does work. And this will let you actually chain orchestrations together through the reactor. So there is an example commented out in Deep Sea that if you wanted to take a look at and you're trying to solve your own problem. So, well, sorry we grayed out there, guys. Where's your shift key? No. Anyways, we're at the end of time and I actually finished right at 1230. So, if you are interested in Deep Sea, or interested in Ceph, or interested in just trying to do your own salt solutions and you need some examples that are in one place and that have links to you know, working code, uh, please visit uh, 
GitHub, SUSE, DeepSea. Thank you much. Thank you, Eric, uh, and thank you for your attention. As usual, you'll find the the slides in in the um, in the app. I, as I said, I've also uploaded a hands-on for installing um, SUSE Enterprise Storage with DeepSea. There's more if you look at our SUSECon. Um, presentations from uh, SUSECon 2017 in Prague. Basically all the talks uh, we had there, um, be it around SUSE Manager, Salt, DeepSea, the con uh, container as a service platform we couldn't really ad address today. Um, they should have the PDFs uploaded. Um, use those as, as free resources as, as uh, you like. Okay, thank you again. Maybe see you next year. <laughs>